Welcome to a studious Saturday. And today we're going to be talking about churn and customer lifetime value. So let's go ahead and start by defining a few things. What do we mean by churn? A synonym for this would be turnover. So how quickly are our customers, our employees, our vendors turning over? In this case, we're going to say churn. What is our churn rate? And in fact, we might say things like, how fast are our customers churning out? Okay, so how fast do they churn out of our business? We might use this kind of as a verb, so they're churning. It's a common KPI, key performance indicator, that is used in many different businesses, especially where you have some sort of reoccurring revenue. It's used to calculate customer lifetime value. And customer lifetime value is very important because it tells us the value in dollars that we get from that customer over their lifetime, over the entire time they spend with us. That's very important when you think about it because we might do things like decide how much we're willing to spend to acquire a customer based on how much we're going to get out of that customer. We'll talk about that in a little more detail here in a minute. It's also critical for subscription businesses. Okay, so um, any business that has a subscription, whether it's your ISP, whether it is your cable provider, whether it is Netflix, your streaming or internet services, or a traditional magazine, those subscription businesses, it's very critical for. It's really important for all businesses with returning customers. So let's get into a very basic calculation of churn. So churn can be calculated in a number of ways, and I'm going to start out very basic here. And I'll mention the differences between my calculations and um, perhaps a more sophisticated analysis, but I'm going to steer away from some of that so that we just get the basic concepts here. So we can calculate it just based on raw numbers. The number of customers lost in a period divided by the number of total customers at the beginning of a period. So for example, I have five total customers at the start of the year. I lose one of those customers during the year. So I've lost one customer out of five. I now have my fraction here that I can calculate, and I can calculate that I have a churn rate of 20%. Another way to look at this is the customer retention rate. How well are we actually retaining our customers? So we can say that our customer retention rate is 80%. We'll get into the implications of this in a little bit, but having a high churn rate is generally not a good thing. We want to keep that churn rate low for a number of different reasons that we'll get into. Customer lifetime period. How long does that customer stay with us? So this is calculated in this case in years because I was using years before. We'd use whatever time period we're calculating in. So it's one divided by the churn rate. Okay, so one year in this case. So we have a churn of 20%. Well, that's going to yield a customer lifetime period of one divided by 0.20 or five years. Okay, so on average, a customer is gonna stay with us for five years. Some of them may stay with us for 10 years, others may leave almost immediately. But on average, given that churn rate, we can expect customers to, on average, be ho holding on to our service or continue to use our service for another five years. So from here, we can calculate the customer lifetime value. What is the value of that customer over those five years? So this is figured as the revenue per customer or per user divided by the churn rate. Notice that the measure has to be in the same time period. Revenue per user, if I'm measuring by months, then I need to have the churn rate by months. In this case, I've been using examples in years. So I'm going to assume that my revenue that I receive from a customer in a given year, the, the in this case the profit, is $300. So $300 divided by a churn rate of 0 0.20 means that I receive $1,500 on average from a customer. That's the customer lifetime value given that particular churn rate. 
Now, as I mentioned, I'm going to try and keep it simple. There's a couple things that I did not do here that some of you that are well acquainted with finance are going to notice right off. I didn't calculate what that profit was. I just said that profit was $300. We would want to calculate what is our revenue, our gross revenue from the customer, what is our direct and indirect costs, and uh, we would want to come up with an accurate measure there. Also, we would do this over time and we'd take into account the time value of money, right? So we'd discount these future cash flows back to the present value. So I'm going to keep it simple here, but I want you to realize that most businesses, when they're starting to look at big numbers, they start to be concerned about the time value of money because it can add up. And so if we are not increasing the amount that we're getting from each customer, either by increasing the amount that we charge to the customer or decreasing our costs over time, then um, this $300 this year, well, that's not going to be worth the same as $300 five years from now. So let's look at how different churn rates affect the customer lifetime value. If we have a churn rate of 0 0.20, well, that's $1,500 is our customer lifetime value. However, what if we were to be able to change that by 5%? So we were able to do something to our product or the way that we're retaining our customers such that we decrease our churn rate by 5%. Well, that then turns the customer lifetime value calculation into $2,000 as a result. Okay, And this can have a big effect on profit. So if you were to assume that we have 800 customers to start, and we had these various churn rates, you can see how that affects our profit. Okay, so this can have a significant impact on the bottom line. Now, if we go back to the customer lifetime value calculation, and let's talk about what that means. The fact that we get $1,500 out of this customer during their entire lifetime. Well, it means that if we spend less than $1,500 to acquire that customer, in theory, we're making a profit. We would want to spend no more than $1,500 to acquire that customer. Now, this sounds a little bit goofy, I realize, when you're first starting out. But back in the dot-com boom, there were many companies that were started that were dot-com um, darlings, if you will, in the late 90s. And it turns out that they maybe had a customer lifetime value of $40, and it was taking them $100 to acquire that new customer. Now, there are businesses that still do this to this day, but what they're trying to do is grow really, really fast. So they may be trying to dominate a market. But most businesses are looking at this and trying to decide how much we, do we want to spend to acquire a new customer, and they're trying to do it at some rate less than the customer lifetime value. Another point I want to make is that churn is in many ways a speed limit on growth. It determines how fast a company can grow. As the company grows, it's harder and harder to find new customers re to replace those that churned. There's a couple of reasons for this. One is if you're in a small town or if you're even in a relatively large town, you may have customers that come to you and if they churn away because of a bad reason, they don't like your service, they're unlikely to come back and be lured back in. And you don't want to churn through the entire population of potential customers in your area. So that can be one issue. But it also just simply limits the speed at which you can grow. So churn is in many ways an unyielding force that continues to grind against our profits, grind against our ability to grow our business, and is always kind of there in the background working against us. So let me try and illustrate that with an analogy and see if you can start to understand why we want to limit churn, especially in, if we're in a very fast growing company.
In business, we often think about churn as being like holes in a bucket. It's leaking customers out. And see, even though we're adding new water, we're adding new customers into our business, it limits our growth. And so with a certain level of customers coming in, we may only get to a certain level of income, level of revenue. And even if we start to increase the number of customers coming in to our business, and we go up in the amount of revenue, this is gonna to continue to be a constraint on our growth rate. We could grow much faster if we could simply plug a couple of these holes up and then the volume would go up faster. Our revenue would go up faster, the amount of revenue that we have. So I hope this analogy helps you understand why for startups, especially startups that are trying to grow fast, getting to a high level, filling that bucket quickly means reducing churn. So having a high churn rate may be fine if you really don't want your business to expand beyond a certain level. If you're a barber, if you offer some other service and you have people come in and they churn out fairly regularly, that may not be a problem because there may, may be enough inflow of new customers to kind of keep your business at that level. But for startups that want to grow fast, churn is a big issue. So now let's check your knowledge on how you calculate churn and customer lifetime value. So if your average customer pays you $50 per month and you lose 15 customers out of a base of $375 per month, then your customer lifetime value is what? Well, you should have gotten 1,250. How you calculate that was simply take 50 and divide it by 15 over 375, your churn rate. Now, what happens if you were able to decrease this churn rate and lose just 12 customers instead? Well, once again, that significantly impacts your bottom line. You're making $300 uh, more per customer. So that's a significant increase. Now calculating churn this way is relatively simple and it's easy for us to understand, but there are some confounding variables that we might want to consider in our business. So the first thing I want you to understand is that revenue may vary by customer. In our business, we may receive more from one customer than we do from another in terms of revenue and profit. In restaurants, this is fairly common. I might go in and get the early bird special where someone else is going to come in and they're going to spend $200 on a bottle of wine and maybe get several bottles of wine. So they're going to want to make sure those customers don't churn compared to a low value customer like myself. So in this case, you might actually look at churn in a different way. You might look at churn in terms of the dollars that are churning out of your business. So the dollars of reoccurring revenue that are lost in a period divided by the total reoccurring revenue at the beginning of a period. So this is a method you may want to use if you have a business where you don't receive the same amount of profit or same amount of revenue from all your customers, that you maybe want to segment those customers. You maybe want to look at churn in terms of dollars. There's a couple other things that can go on. One is that customer spend can change. So perhaps all your customers sign up for the trial period and they are all at the pro user level, but then some of those drop off, but the ones that stay end up upgrading. They go to a higher level. This is actually what you see with Amazon Web Services. That is a cloud-based computing service. And it's kind of interesting if you look at their numbers, they do lose customers every month, but the customers that stay end up spending a whole lot more. And so that can be another kind of confounding variable that you might want to consider or look at. Now we talked about churn in terms of both numbers and revenue. What types of churn exist? 
Well, there's a couple of different types. These are probably the, the main three or the three that um, we consider. Voluntary churn, a customer takes action to cancel their subscription or not re renew. They do not want to be your customer anymore. Involuntary churn, they fail to take action to renew. Maybe they registered with an email address they're not checking anymore and they failed to see the renewal notice. Uh, their credit card expired. All sorts of examples of why we might have involuntary churn. And then happy churn. Your product or service worked. Customers no longer need your service or product since their problem was solved. Good for you, but you're not going to get any more money out of that customer. So how do we deal with these different types of churn? Well, there's probably many, many web pages and books that have been written on this or chapters that have been written on this, but here's a few that I think are worth looking at. Reducing voluntary churn, those people that are leaving you on purpose, look for factors that correlate with churn. So is there something about the population of folks that leave your business that differentiates them from the people that stay? Are there certain factors that might correlate with those that stay? What makes your product sticky for them and not sticky for others? Actually talking with your customers, perhaps even asking them to fill out a survey if you're doing something online with a lot of customers, if you are taking a more personalized approach, perhaps seeing if they will allow you to do a phone interview and ask them why they have left. Reducing involuntary churn. Simply remind the customers of, of upcoming renewals. I always appreciate that when I receive a notice on an upcoming renewal. I think that's a good business practice, but it lets the customer know that their credit card will be charged, that uh, the customer can expect to see their service continue. I think that's valuable even if the customer is not actually using your product on a regular basis because if they all of a sudden see that charge on their credit card and they haven't got a notice about it, they may be inclined to call the credit card company. But if you notified them that, hey, your service is going to renew in 45 days, what are the odds that the customer is going to remember to cancel that service the next 45 days? Well, might not be uh, that high. And so the customer, then when they see that charge, says, oh, yeah, I uh, did get that renewal notice and I failed to take action. Okay, So it may not hurt you as much as you think to actually remind the customer that they are about to have their service renew. Now, how do you deal with happy churn? Well, ask them to help you bring in more customers. So develop a referral program. Ask for testimonials. So see if they will put a testimonial of how great your service is in your literature, on your website, on your social media. So I hope this gave you a good introduction to churn and customer lifetime value, as well as some of the issues that you may have to deal with when you get into a more sophisticated analysis of these type of metrics.